please help me welcome Dr. Howard. Thanks, Ken. And um, he did corral me at the, at the meeting two weeks ago. And um, just uh, to fill in some of the information, I actually got to Flagstaff in August. I started teaching just this past August at NAU. And I got there the day before I had to start work. So I'm still, I'm still trying to catch up um, as a result. And I'm really glad that it's the start of March break, so I might be able to do some catching up. Um, but anyway, um, you know, I'm here today. I want to talk to you a little bit about Belize, especially since a bunch of you guys are going to be going. And um, I move around. My ears are still popping coming down the, the mountain. Um, the one good thing, though, about coming down from Flagstaff, I, I think I mentioned to somebody, you can put your car in neutral and then just, <laughs> and then just cruise. So yeah, save a lot of gas on that way. Anyway, guys, um, you know, what, what I'm going to do tonight is show you some slides uh, first on some of the surface sites um, in western Belize because I am almost certain that those of you going to Belize will be going to western Belize. It is, you know, in spite of the fact that somebody in the audience might not agree with me because her family comes from Belize City, western Belize is like western U.S. is the best part of the country. <coughs> And, um, and it was where I was born, and that's where I do all my archaeological research. But anyway, without much ado, just in case you guys don't know, don't know where the hell Belize is, <laughs> follow the yellow arrows and you, will, you, know, you can figure it out. Um, the one thing that's pretty obvious is there's a lot more green down in Belize um, <laughs> than in Arizona. In fact, I remember when I first uh, came for my job interview and I landed in Phoenix, I was going, there's something wrong, there's something wrong, and it's like, yeah, it's all brown. <laughs> but it was, pleasant, it was a pleasant surprise as I got up to, to Flagstaff. But anyway, so there's uh, Belize uh, right on the uh, Caribbean Sea, famous for having the second longest barrier reef in the world, second only to Australia. Um, but we also have lots of archaeological sites. Uh, Belize is a, a, you know, a, a, an important part, we like to think the most important part of the Maya world. And indeed, uh, many discoveries in Belize uh, have put Belize on the map as either some of the earliest uh, remains of the ancient Maya, uh, some of the most awesome caves, as you will see in a little while, and, uh, and also some great archaeology. Um, and today, I'm going to share with you, you know, some of the sites in western Belize there. This is a close-up. That's the Guatemalan border right there. And you have the two main branches of the Belize River. And Cajal Pitch is where I presently conduct a lot of my research. But I've worked also at Caracol, at Shunantanich, um, and uh, on a site called Baking Pot. And if you go to Western Belize, like I said, I'm almost certain, make sure they take you to Cajal Pitch, or I'll come back and beat you. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, no bias, of course. Um, you know, so there's Kalpech, and I'm sure you'll go to Shenantanich too, and Caracol is also awesome. So I'm going to, you know, like I said, I'm going to show you uh, some imagery, uh, some slides off those sites that I had the incredible privilege of working. Um, as Ken said in the introduction, I used to teach at the University of New Hampshire, and in uh, 1999, the then Minister of Tourism and Culture for Belize called me and invited me to go down to Belize to do this uh, tourism development project. Belize was interested in developing some of its archaeological sites for tourism, for their tourism potential. Um, and we were sort of late comers to this game. Mexico and Guatemala were, you know, years ahead of us. So um, I just couldn't refuse. Uh, you know, as an archaeologist, and I'm sure there are several of you in the audience here, um, if somebody tells you, guess what? We're going to give you, you know, a few million dollars and you can go excavate and conserve some of the biggest sites in the country. It's like a, it's like, it's a no brainer, right? So I took two years leave of absence from the University of New Hampshire and um, I went down and then I found out it was going to be a four year project. And I was like, oh gosh, what am I going to do here? Um, and tried to extend my leave, but the university said, no, we need you back. And it was one of the hardest decisions I, I made. 
Um, but I decided to stay in Belize and uh, promised my wife, don't worry, we'll go back up to the States, uh, you know, one of these days. Um, and 14 years later, you know, <clears throat> thankfully she's from Montana and those Montana women are tough. Right? And I mean, and she worked with me at all, all these sites. But anyway, so that's sort of the story of how I ended up going back to Belize. And then last year, I decided, okay, it's time to go back or Micah is going to divorce me or get rid of me or whatever. So, and um, got lucky and I got the job at NAU. But anyway, back to Belize and especially Western Belize. And one of the first places, like I said, I'm going to take you is the site of Caracol, which is right there. It's about, uh, about an hour and a half, two hours drive from San Ignacio town. And Caracol, has been the focus of research activity by two very close friends and colleagues of mine, Arlen and Diane Chase, that uh, work at the University of Central Florida. But like I said, uh, between 2001 and 2004, as the director of this big project, um, I also did some work at Carroll Cole where we were excavating and conserving a lot of the, a lot of the buildings. So here was uh, where our camp uh, is. Um, you know, it was like, the, we used to call it the Caracol Hilton. Um, of course, you couldn't get any cold beer unless you brought it yourself, but we did have a couple freezers, but we were not allowed to use those freezers for anything else other than food, because they, you had to bring in everything, like I said, for two hours back here. But anyway, uh, so there's the camp, and we started to um, excavate and conserve some of the large architecture. Caracol is an awesome site. It certainly ranked. Uh, among the top, you know, political players in the ancient Maya world, um, with other sites like Tikal and Calac Tikal in Guatemala, Calakmul in Campeche, or Chichen Itza in Yucatan, etc. But Chichen is much later. Um, Caracol was certainly one of those dominant sites. Lots of beautiful carved monuments that talk about its conflicts and wars with places like Tikal and also alliances it made with Kalakmul. Um, this is the A Plaza here with an Eastern group that served for astronomical purposes back in its heyday. Uh, this is another view taken from a helicopter of that A group with some of the other pyramids that we excavate and partly conserve. One of the reasons for the partial conservation is because my approach was if I could not understand the architecture, I was not going to reconstruct it. So I tried to conserve what I found. And you will see you know, a fair bit of that. Um, one of the main uh, sort of achievements we, we certainly had at Caracol was the excavation and conservation of the, of the site's largest pyramidal building. This structure is about 150 feet tall. And I remember walking up these steps. That's all there was in January of 2001. We had just finished building the camp. And I remember walking up with this colleague of mine, and I stopped in the middle, because that's just the middle. There's still stuff on top. And I looked at him, and I said, you know what? What the hell am I doing? I've never excavated anything half the size of this. And graduate school does not teach you anything about good conservation of monumental architecture. Um, I mean, like I said, this thing's a behemoth. So, I figured out the way I was going to do it. I put blinders right there, or you can take your cap and just put the cap right there. And I said, I'm going to tackle the lower one third first, then I'll move up to the second uh, or the midsection, and then I'll move up to the top section. And that's exactly what we did. So in January, we started excavating, conserving the base. Um, and those are guys down there, by the way, if you want some idea of scale. All right? there, there are two guys standing right there. Um, and so then we were just, you know, completing that, then moving up to the midsection, then before tackling the upper section. And I had um, actually uh, almost 100 workers. And we would work 20 days nonstop. Um, you know, and I remember saying to the guys, if you're Christian, you're just going to have to say your prayers on the, on the building. It works 20 days straight, and then we'd take 10 days off and go into town and you know what archaeologists do after 20 days in the bush. <laughs> so, and we finished this excavation and conservation in exactly 377 days. I wanted to do it within the year, but we lost 10 days. And that's sort of the end of that work. And again, you can see there's somebody for scale. 
So just massive, massive uh, building. Um, and you know, one of these days, if I come back, I can talk more about you know, Maya architecture and some of the, the interesting things about it. Um, there's a structure right across from it um, from this large uh, pyramid building. And it has some awesome stucco masks. And one of the things that we've been doing in Belize, in fact, we're probably at the forefront of applying um, the use of fiberglass replication of stucco monuments and uh, placing them in front of buildings. Um, and in this, this is one example where we found the stucco mask in front of this building. And the quandary was like, OK, how the heck am I going to preserve this? I either do like the Maya did, and that is rebury it, or come up with a method. And the method we came up with was to do a copy in fiberglass and then place that copy about a foot in front of the original and then pour soft dirt uh, in between. Um, and like I said, the Maya themselves had difficulty trying to keep these things. Um, they would have to replaster and repaint it regularly because the tropical rain and heat or sun um, it, you know, just wreaks havoc on this kind of stuff because of the contraction during the dry weather and the expansion during the rainy season. And then we get all kinds of little bugs boring through the limestone. So eventually the Maya themselves gave up and they would just build over it, cover it up. Um, we did exactly that, but we did it, we covered it with a replica in fiberglass. And if you didn't know it was fiberglass, you wouldn't be able to tell. So if I didn't tell you. Lots of palaces uh, around uh, Karakol too. So certainly if you manage to get up there on your trip, I think you're going to, you're going to really enjoy it. Um, um, you know, and we continue to do research and uh, conservation work at Karakol. The next slide I want to take you, so Karakol is way down here is the site of Shunantinich, right there. And I also had, the, like I said, the privilege of, of doing work there around the same time. In fact, we were doing this work concurrently at seven sites. My theme song used to be on the road again. <laughs> because I would go and spend you know, about uh, three, four days at one site and walk around with the guys, uh, you know, like the conservator and the other guys who were working with me. And I'd say, OK, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. We're going to do the other, et cetera. And then, um, and then leave, go to the other site, and do the same thing, and just continuously doing the circle. Um, so Shunantinich and Skahapetch are the next two sites I want to share some imagery with you. So there again, uh, Shunantinich. Here you can see the, mo the modern town of San Ignacio, which is my hometown. Um, and then Shunantinich is about six miles from there. So if you stay at a hotel there, it's about 20 minute drive, very, very close. Um, but anyway, again, Shunantinich, this site, um, I, I, I always remember, I, I sort of ate my, my own words on this site. I had promised myself that I would never, ever work at Chinantinich. Why? Well, because almost every archaeologist who had ever worked in Belize, especially the Brits, um, and I did my, my PhD in England, you know, no dislike for the Brits, but almost all British archaeologists who ever worked in Belize did work at Chinantinich, and then a bunch of you know, American and Canadian archaeologists. So I thought, no, no, uh, enough people have worked there. And indeed, just before I went there, um, this other colleague of mine from, who was at UCLA at the time, this guy named Richard Leventhal, had done some, some work there. But like I said, I ate my words. And in 2001, I ended up at Shunantinich and I came up with a sort of conservation plan. And so one of the first structures, one of the things I was trying to do was trying to determine, OK, if we want to develop these sites for tourism, you need some wow factor all right, to compete against Mexico and Guatemala. But I, I did not, at the same time, I did not want to do you know, what some of my Guatemalan and Mexican colleagues have done, you know, where it's mostly complete excavation and conservation. So anyway, so I decided to tackle the Castillo at Chinantanich. This was the before picture. And here we are when we finished that midsection. And then we decided to tackle, I did the same sort of thing here, by the way. You know, do a section of the lower section, but not in, you know, not in totality. And then a part of the midsection, and then the upper section. And I'll show you a slide right now. Right here and over there, there were some beautiful stucco decoration as well. In fact, 
Originally, when the Maya were still here and using this building, this building on top was decorated with stucco on all four sides. But the north side and the south side behind it had not preserved. The east side, miraculously, you know, and why the east side was preserved, quien sabe, as they say in Spanish, you know, who knows. But, uh, but anyway, so here the, this building is, like I said, you know, from, from the start here to as we went through and conserved the front. Um, then here, it, the stucco frieze over there is right there. Now, I, I, again, I didn't throw in all the slides because, I mean, I could be here all night talking to you about this stuff. <laughs> and uh, you guys would be passed out and I'd still be going. Um, but anyway... This thing here is about 30 feet across and about 10 feet high. And what you're looking at is the fiberglass replica. Before we do this, and I'll explain to you, and, and you know, like I said, if I ever come back, I'll bring some slides showing some of the process. Um, before we did this uh, conservation work, we used to have a big roof, a metal roof, over it to protect it from, from rain. rain or water is public enemy number one to the conservator in well any part of the world, but especially in the tropics. Well, like I said, we used to have this metal roof. And every time we got a tropical storm or a hurricane, we used to donate the whole structure to Guatemala. Because this, the, the site is right on the border. And it's the highest point. So the hurricane winds would come, lift the darn roof, and just sail it over to Guatemala. <laughs> And of course, they never repatriated the, the roof. <laughs> I still use it as a bone of contention with some of my Guatemalan colleagues. So again, you know, I was thinking, okay, what are we going to do? Well, there was a, a big challenge here, and I'll go back a couple of slides. This site is to get there, you have to cross this little hand-cranked ferry across the river. Um, you know, for years we've been thinking, ah, oh, we should put a bridge, but all the tourists go, no, you can't do that. We like the old ferry. So we have a sort of new ferry, but it's still hand cranked. So you can't get anything up there. And, and this stucco decoration is about you know, 75 feet up. You can't get a crane up there either. So we had to make, the, where we made some of these, uh, by the way, um, and I'll do this really quickly, because like I said, I'll keep you here all night. Um, you can't do a replica from the original, because if you paint, the, uh, the latex with the gauze on the original, when you peel that off, bye-bye original. And I would have been sacrificed slowly, <laughs> right, by, by the whole country of Belize. So we actually had to produce a replica made out of clay. And we did that right there. You know, there's a huge flat area there. So we would make an actual replica. And I remember going and looking at the guy goes, oh, that nose looks more like mine than the Maya guy there. <laughs> but we could run up there and take our tape measure and because we had to do it three-dimensionally. So it was a good place to, to do the replica. Then we would make the mold out of latex and gauze from the one that we did and then pour the, um, the fiberglass, etc. But how the hell were we going to get it up top? We did it in four sections. And we had to pull it using uh, ropes and pulleys. But, and I imported from England uh, several steel rods about that big, where uh, stainless steel rods, because then we could you know, anchor it into the building. And it, when you go there, I'm sure you're going to go, you can't tell where the seams are. We managed to do it that, that well. Um, I, I was a non-believer until the guys actually pulled it off. So. But anyway, like I said, um, another building at that site. So and I'm actually going back to Belize this summer uh, to continue doing some of my field work, and I might be going back to Shenantonich, taking some of my NAU students for the first time on a field methods in archaeology uh, course. And now to my baby, um, Cajalpech. Cajalpech is my Hotel California. You know the line of the song that says you can check in, but you can't leave? <clears throat> That's the case here. I did my PhD research at Cajalpech. I can't even remember how long ago. And uh, every year I keep going back. In fact, my wife keeps asking me, is there anything left at Cajalpech that you have not dug? And I keep finding things to do. So <clears throat> there's still a lot more. 
So Calpets, like I said, it's actually smack in the middle of San Ignacio town. It is now encircled by the town. But one of the things that um, we did, um, one of, in fact, one of the first things I did way back in the 80s when I started to do the research for my PhD was we demarcated an area for, a, for an archaeological park. And today, it's one of the only areas with nice high forests right in town. But anyway, this is sort of a you know, reconstruction of the downtown part of Cajalpech. When you visit these Maya sites today, it's only the downtown section that you actually see. The rest of the city extends for kilometers in every direction, and that's certainly true here. Um, you know, so here we were um, excavating, and I started this project when I was teaching in Canada, where, and I took down a bunch of ragamuffin Canadian students to work with me. And then when I was in New Hampshire, I also brought down some ragamuffin New Englanders. Um, and now I'm going to take some Southwesterners to, to Cajal Pitch. So here we are, you know, doing some of the excavation work. And at the end, you know, the, the one thing about the limestone, it, it starts to darken nicely. So it fits in uh, beautifully with the, with the environment. That's that same structure. And there's that large courtyard. Uh, the structure I just showed you is right here at the corner. Um, here again, you can see some of the students excavating. It uh, doesn't look like much, but eventually once we get all the overburden uh, removed and conserved, voila, you know, you can see this building at one time, this roof would have gone right across there. So again, this is a different angle from that same building. Um, the last four years, I have focused work on the Eastern Triadic Shrine at Cajal Pitch. It's on the east side, Triadic, because there are three pyramids, and so there's the before, and there's the after. That's after only um, three summers work. So again, you know, some of the guys that work with me have been working with me since the Paleo-Indian time. Um, <laughs> so they're really good, because I can tell them now, you know, okay, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that, and they get it done. Um, you know, it's just awesome. Well, one of the, the great things about excavating this building is we found some of the most amazing tombs ever found, not just at Galpech, but in the Maya world. Um, I'm actually heading to Tulane on a week from today. Um, the Tulane has its Maya weekend, and this time is um, uncovering royal Maya burials or something like that. And I'll be talking about the awesome tombs we have found in this middle building here at Cajal Pech. And I'm gonna share with you just a few um, slides of the awesome um, grave goods that came out of these tombs that also include some very unique objects that have heretofore not ever found in the Maya world. So again, you know, not a very large site, but certainly um, incredible. So there's that structure, and I started to dig down Often the tombs of the royal uh, elite or the elite rulers of the sites were buried in these eastern shrines, especially in the Belize River Valley. And here we are, in fact, this guy here is Mark Zender, who is a professor of epigraphy, Maya hieroglyphic systems, at Tulane University. Um, and Mark has been working with me uh, there. And so here we are going down. I remember uh, this is uh, my, my um, bioarchaeologist. And um, she said, don't take a picture, because I promised my husband I would not go anywhere that's kind of dangerous. <laughs> and of course, you know, I, I didn't listen. Uh, but a week later, she was so excited about the stuff we were finding that she goes, take a picture. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, um, but you know, like I said, some, you know, the, the beautiful jewelry out of jade that came out from, uh, from this uh, barrel, this is a close up. You can see some of the ear flares there, this long uh, tube, probably you know, either used as a pectoral. This is a pendant of a, of a maze god. Uh, this beautiful polychrome uh, vase, actually it's stucco, and you can see some kind of, you know, it looks almost like, um, like a dragon, and in fact it's probably an earth dragon as, the, as they call it. There's the, the mouth or the maw and teeth. And then there's the eye, so just awesome. Um, this is a beautiful jade uh, plaque about that big that was found right over the, the waist of this one ruler. And much of this, by the way, is on exhibit right now in the US. Um, before I left Belize, 
um, I signed an agreement for this stuff to go um, on exhibition. It started off in Minnesota. It then went to Colorado, to Denver. It's presently in Boston. <laughs> and in a few months, it's going to be heading to San Diego. Um, just one of the best exhibitions, not just because it has stuff from Belize, but Are trust me. Pardon? You know, I wish it would come to Phoenix. Um, you know, it's just, like I said, it's just an awesome, awesome exhibit. Well, just want to, like I said, I wanted to share with you a couple of the unique objects that we have found in, the, in, in a couple of these tombs. One of them was this, it looks like a deer antler ring or tube. And it has hieroglyphic inscriptions. We actually found three of them. Uh, two of them were broken and fragmented, but we can put it together. And this one was the only one that's really complete. And Mark Zender was able to, you know, decipher uh, the hieroglyphic inscription on it and actually say this is the ring or bone <laughs> tube of Lord so-and-so. All right, and I'll, like I said, I'm going to share that with you in a minute. Well, in another one of the tombs, we found uh, fragments of this turtle shell also with hieroglyphic inscriptions. And what was really cool about it is that the hieroglyphic inscription on the turtle shell from a separate tomb also included the same glyphs at the end as the bone ring or bone tube. And so allowing us to finally establish the elite lineage um, or the toponym as we call it sometimes, it's like the, the emblem glyph of the site of Cajalpech. And um, so there you can, see, like I said, you know, it, it, and I didn't put down the, uh, the, the translation for it, but it says the bone tube or ring of Lord uh, Chan, no, Kinich Chan Kawil Khan Balam. And it's a long title. It's just like if I were to say Her Highness, Her Royal Majesty, Queen Elizabeth. Only Elizabeth is a name. The rest are all royal titles. Same with this. So Chan is very likely the family name. And Kawil is like he of the sun, et cetera, et cetera. So the other unique object we found in this tomb was this ink pot made out of Kong shell. We see lots of imagery, imagery um, where these scribes are sitting down and they have a palette and often uh, a Kong shell holding in their hands and you, they have the stylus on their hand dipping. Well, only four of these have ever been found. Um, two in Guatemala, one in Belize, and then this one from Carl Pitch. One of the ones in Guatemala actually had red pigment. Um, only one has been found in archaeological context, the other two are in private collections. The one from Belize has blue, red, yellow, and black pigment. What is really cool about that too, those colors are the colors associated with the cardinal directions in the Maya. And you will see some of that coming up in, in a little bit. So, like I said, some, um, this is also on exhibition right now in this traveling exhibition, like the jade head and some of the other uh, jade jewelry. Um, but anyway, that, you know, that sort of gives you a little taste of some of the surface sites in Western Belize. Now, I really wanted to talk to you not so much about that, but about some of the awesome cave stuff that we have been doing. So, again, um, I've, if I'm going a little too fast, let me know, but I don't want to keep you guys all night. So, um, in addition to working on all these awesome sites in Western Belize, and I also have worked on some awesome sites in the Belize district and, and you know, northern and southern Belize. But I've done some, uh, you know, I've, I've had the great privilege of working too at some of the cave sites. Um, just like surface sites, we have hundreds and hundreds of cave sites all over Belize. In fact, we have the perfect recipe for cave formation. The central massive of the Maya mountains are all granitic. And all around it, we have limestone hills. Well, rain falls up on the granitic sandy um, summits, and sandy soils are very acidic. That water flows down, hits the limestone, and it starts to dissolve it. And you add a few million years, and voila, you know, perfect recipe for making lots of caves. And some of our caves, you know, many of them have rivers going through. In fact, most of the caves in Belize are um, formed by rivers. And we have some huge caves. In fact, 
This cavern, called the Chiquibul Cavern, is one of the longest cave systems anywhere in the Western Hemisphere. We have mapped 22 kilometers of this cave, and it kept going. But unfortunately, it went under the Belize-Guatemala border, and there was no darn immigration guy there to <laughs> stamp the passports. So we had to stop and you know, di discontinue. But um, like I said, you can see some people here. There's a person standing on that rock there, there, and there. Uh, to give you some idea of scale. Other caves are a little tighter uh, for the more brave of spirit and brave of heart. And um, I usually, when I take my students, I said, come on, you know, if you can get your shoulders through, you can make it, you can do it. Um, and I usually take a little bit of uh, shortening just in case, you know, to, <laughs> it makes you sort of squeeze through some of the small openings a little bit better. Um, so anyway, here we are. This is actually my wife and my, my brother-in-law and his wife uh, they were taking them caving. They were down visiting from Montana. Um, some caves are a little more challenging. Um, you have to rappel down. And I, I usually tell people, I remember uh, 15, 20 years ago, rappel, yeah, let's do it. Now it's like, why the hell am I still doing this? <laughs> I, I, as you guys know, as you get older, your sense of mortality becomes more real. <laughs> I'm there, folks. I'm, I'm really there with you. Um, but anyway, you know, sometimes you have to brave through, uh, climb up um, on some, uh, up, you know, in areas where there are rapids. Um, so cave work is challenging. But one of the most amazing things is that I have yet to go into any cave where the Maya did not precede me. I mean, the Maya were always there first. And the evidence that they were there still remain. You can see the two footprints here in a cave we aptly called Footprint Cave. Um, in other caves, you know, we find lots of uh, complete pots, sometimes cave art. I'm taking one of my students down to do a master's thesis on some rock art that we found in one of these caves. And of course, we also find lots of human remains in many of these caves. Um, and in this case, we had like nine individuals here. You can see some of the skulls right there. But why? Why is it that the Maya were using many of these caves? Well, to answer that question, it's important that you have some knowledge of Maya ideology, Maya religion. Um, and we are fortunate working in the Maya area because um, not only do we have a rich ethno-historic record, um, recorded by the Spanish. The Spanish were also awful. I mean, you know, Bishop Landa, who I'll chat a bit about, you know, destroyed lots of books, etc. Um, but the native Maya still continue living there, and some of them in very traditional ways. And so, what do we know of Maya ideology? Well, let's first look at their cosmology. Like most cultures all over the world, the Maya divided their universe both vertically and horizontally. The vertically, the Maya had a tripartite universe, or perceived of a tripartite universe. We do the same thing. If I ask you where is heaven, you'd probably go that way. If Earth, we're here. And if I ask the underworld, down below. Well, the same sort of thing with the Maya. So vertically, right, three levels. So the heavens, Earth, and the underworld. And horizontally, they perceive of a, of a world that was quadripartite, or four-sided, or you know, um, quadrilateral, if you want, with colors associated with the cardinal directions. So white was north, yellow was south, red was east, and black was west. And the east-west um, comes from a perception, and not just a perception, but a belief that the sun obviously rises in the east and then travels to you know, the 13 levels of the heavens. And at night, or at dusk, the sun is transformed into the jaguar god of the underworld. And the, as the jaguar god of the underworld, the sun must then travel through the underworld, through the nine levels of the underworld. Because the Maya subdivided the heavens into 13 layers, and the underworld into nine layers. And why choose the jaguar? I remember you know, thinking about that, and it was like, duh. Look at the color of the jaguar. It combines both light and darkness. Right? It's got you know, spots. It's orange with black spots. Or some people say black with orange spots, depending how you want to look at it. So again, you know, um, very interesting uh, cosmogram. The other, um, so 
know, why did I put the slide in there? Anyway, same, I, the same sort of thing. Well, one of the things that's really interesting is that often when we find information data, uh, artwork in some of these caves, knowing some of that ideology allows you to try to link what you're seeing with the belief system. And I remember not too long ago, I uh, came across this cave, and you can see there's a jaguar. You know, um, this was done much later when you know, the f great Maya scribes were no longer around. But nonetheless, you, know, you can see the jaguar there, and there are some uh, pseudoglyphs there that may, they may have been trying to say, you know, it's the road uh, of the sun, in this case, the sun that's been transformed into the jaguar god of the underworld, uh, through the earth and through the cave. Um, the Maya also believed that certain gods lived in caves. And the gods that are associated um, with residency in caves include the rain god Chak. And the reason for this is that often you see you know, mist coming out of these caves. And all these caves are formed by water. So where is many of the streams coming from? from inside of caves. So the rain god is often, well, it's, it's believed that the rain god resides in caves. Earth spirits also um, live in caves. And most importantly, humans originated in caves. In fact, the Maya believed that all humans were made from corn. Now, how do you make corn grow? You dig a hole in the ground and you put the corn in there and water drops on it and it sprouts. And in fact, depending on what part of Mesoamerica you are, you know, the mythologies associated with the origin of corn often says corn was either found under a rock, in a hole, in a cave. That it's one of those versions, like I said, depending in what part of Mesoamerica you go. So again, the creator of humans, the corn god, also you know, is associated with the underworld. And we'll chat a little bit more about that. Caves are also perceived as the womb of the earth, right? And therefore associated with fertility. Now, what's amazing is that the Maya, you know, you're looking at it and probably going, oh, you know, erotic art in the Maya area. Believe me, the Maya were darn prudes. Have any of you ever been to Pompeii? Did you visit the little room yes. with every, any kids in here? <laughs> you can bleep this one. Um, but you know, where there's like every position you can think of on, you know, and then some um, depicted on the wall. Well, the Maya were prudes. But the few times that we find um, any kind of erotic type art is usually associated with caves. Um, so again, you know, you can, you can see that. Another major source of information that we have about the role of caves in Maya society comes from Bishop Landa. That's the guy who collected so many of the beautiful painted books by the Maya and destroyed them because he believed they contain, uh, you know, paganistic uh, information and uh, all this kind of, you know, stuff. And so he single-handedly destroyed most of them. The other source comes from a book we call the Popol Vuh. And the Popol Vuh was a native account that has two sections. Part of the Popol Vuh talks about the creation of humans. And then the other part is associated with it, and it talks about a story we call the myth of the hero twins. And I'm gonna give you the really quick little version um, of the myth of the hero twins. But, um, Father Francisco Jimenez, when he worked in Guatemala in the early 18th century, um, was able to record the story and uh, wrote it down in Spanish. That um, book was eventually lost and uh, found by this guy here, by another uh, Catholic uh, priest. Um, and in fact, the Catholic priest found both a book written by Bishop Landa and the Papal Vu. But like I said, you know, what is it that the Papal Vu tell us? Well, the first section, like I said, about the origins of human, the creation story. And um, I already sort of you know, told you that the Maya believed that they were made from corn. They actually believed that uh, creation happened three times. The first time the gods created humans, they made them from clay or mud. But these people did not honor and uh, conduct 
the appropriate ceremonies befit of the gods. And so the gods destroy them. The second time the gods attempted to make humans, they make them from wood or sticks. But same thing, these guys dense, not doing what the gods wanted, the gods destroy them. Some of them survive and they become the monkeys of the forest. And that's how the Maya rationalized why some monkeys look cuter than some of us. <laughs> yeah. The third time the gods make humans, they make them from corn. And this corn is found somewhere, like I said, under the ground, under a rock, in a hole, in a cave, etc. The second part of the Popovu talks about this really interesting sto story called the myth of the hero twins. Now, this is the very abbreviated version. Awesome book. You should read it one of these days. It's been translated. There's a free copy you can get by Alan Christensen. Um, you can just Google Puppel Vu, and you can download on PDF format this free version uh, by Alan. Um, really nice guy. Super, super work too. But anyway, in the Puppel Vu, it talks like, okay, it continues talking about creation, but it says, it talks about two sets of twins. The first set of twins, known as Hunapu, uh, one Hunapu and seven Hunapu, um, like playing the ball game, they're hunters, etc. And they're playing this uh, ball game, you know, quite often. And the bouncing of the ball on Earth really annoy the gods of the underworld and said, all right, that's enough. We gotta punish these guys. So they're summoned into the underworld, and the guys go down into the underworld, and they're put through a series of tests. Eventually, they fail the tests, and they're sacrificed. And the gods decapitate them. But they take the head of Hun Hunapu, or one Hunapu, and hang it on this barren tree. And shortly thereafter, the tree begins to bear fruit, and it bears the calabash. Well, they decide to, you know, not allow anybody to go and see this tree. But of course, one of the daughters of the gods of the underworld decides she wants to check this out, and she does. And when she goes to look at the tree, the skull talks to her and beckons her nearer and asks her to extend her hand out. She does, and the skull spits in her hand and she becomes pregnant. Eventually, she can't hide her pregnancy, and the gods decide, all right, off with her head. Um, and, you know, She's being taken to be sacrificed. She convinces the warriors who are going to sacrifice her to let her go back up to Earth to rejoin her mother-in-law and to kill a deer instead and take the heart of the deer as proof of the sacrifice. They agree. She goes up to Earth, goes to live with her mother-in-law, bears a second set of twins. And these second twins, like their father and uncle before them, do the same thing. They like to do magic tricks. Uh, they also play the ball game. And I nearly said, uh, anyway. Um, and so they, they annoy the gods of the underworld. The gods summon them down, and they go down. And they're put through a series of tests, too. But they're a lot more astute and capable than their father and uncle. And they keep you know, outwitting the gods. Um, but eventually, they are, they, they're sacrificed, you know, like I said, I'm going to give you the abbreviated version. They're sacrificed, and they ask that their bones be ground up and thrown into the river. Now look at all the symbolism going on here, folks. What happens if you throw corn in water? Guess what happens to the second set of twins? They come back to life, right? And then they start to travel through the underworld doing a lot of tricks, etc. And one of the things that they did was they would sacrifice each other and bring each other back to life. <laughs> the evil gods hear about these awesome magicians and invite them into their, um, into their court. And, um, and so they do, and the gods said, can you do that to us? And they, of course, oblige. <laughs> but they don't bring the, the gods back to life. And then they go, and they resurrect their father. Remember the skull of, the, of their father? And their father is the corn god. And so then they rise up to the heavens and they go to the three heart stone place of creation where the god, the, their father, then creates the first four humans who become the ancestors of all the Maya. All right, so like I said, that's a very abbreviated version uh, in the Popol Vuh. Well, one of the neat things that, you know, we've been able to see, and in fact, 
Michael Kaur, you know, started talking about this some, some time ago, is that much of the imagery, much of the artwork we find on these beautiful ceramic vases in the Maya area are actually depicting or retelling an aspect or a part of the Popol Vuh. This vessel from Belize, the Hero Twins. Sometimes it's even much more, it's a lot easier to identify the twins because of certain characteristic features on them. Um, this is another vase from uh, Belize. And look at this, it's a woman. She's on the top of a deer and the deer in his mouth has a little tree. And guess how many little round, what I think are calabashes in there. How many levels in the underworld? There are nine fruit. We find a lot of times the number nine associated with underworld themes, all right? So very likely, you know, is it possible that what's being depicted here is, you know, the, the daughter of the god from the underworld, right, who is supposed to be sacrificed. Um, look at this. This is a rollout of a vessel, of a vase. And here you see these twins. And this twin here, look around his mouth. He's got all kinds of spots. He's got, like, jaguar skin sections attached to him. And this guy has dots. In Maya numerical system, a dot stands for the number one. Right? If you have two dots, it's two, three dots. A bar is five right? in Maya numerical system. So that's one Hunapu and his brother Shbalanke. Um, th these are the second set of hero twins. And they're talking to one of the gods of the underworld. And right here in this bundle, there's a skull. There's a face right there. It's their father's skull. Look at it down here. This dude here is Itzamna, this god, uh, one of the, the gods um, who lives in the underworld. And look at the twins there again. Here's the guy with, the, you know, with some of the spots. Um, and you can see some of the hair again, the jaguar. Um, sorry, no, this is Hunapu. And there's uh, the, the jaguar guy. And right there, look, this is a big pot. And right up on, on the pot, there's a skull. So they're going down into the underworld to try to resurrect their father. Um, one of the things that the hero twins do when they go into the underworld, they're forced to play a ball game against the gods of the underworld. Here you can see, look at the guy. He's got all the jaguar spots. This is painted in a cave, um, Natunich. And this is the side of the ball court. There's the ball. And there's a number. How much did I say a bar was equal to? Five. So five. So again, you see those kinds of connections. Once you understand the ideology, you are able to interpret a lot of this art, which is really cool. Um, and then look at this dish that was found. Um, again, in, in, I don't know whether was, this is uh, from a private collection, but nonetheless. The Maya often depict Earth either as a crocodile floating in the water or as a giant turtle. And you can see twins. This one here, look at the jaguar, uh, piece of the jaguar skin on, around his face. There's the guy with the number one. So it's the second set of twins. And there's a crack in the top on the back of the turtle shell. And what's inside is a skull. And he's pouring water. And there's a water lily, right? okay? So this is earth floating on, you know, in the water. Very, you know, simple to see why they would have thought that. Central America practically floats between the two oceans. And he's pouring water to resurrect his father, the corn god, who is seen resurrecting here. So again, like I said, you know, uh, once you start to understand the ideology, uh, it's so easy to interpret some of the incredible artwork. So anyway. You know, why did I then decide to go uh, do some work in caves? Well, right up until um, 19, uh, the, the middle 1990s, not a lot of uh, serious archaeological work had been done in caves. Mostly people going to explore, spend two days, you know, three days. Um, indeed, uh, the bulk of work, good scientific archaeological research, had been done by this really good friend of mine who teaches at UC, um, Cal State LA, uh, James Brady. Um, and I, there were still lots of questions to be asked about what's going on in some of these caves. So I'm not going to bore you with that. I came up with a whole bunch of different um, questions I wanted to address when I went into the cave based on what other people had said, including people like Bishop Landa. 
Um, so there were some of the, the questions. And so I decided, where am I going to work? Western Belize, of course. It's home. Right? And I decided to investigate cave sites to do a regional study and compare. Because if you just work at one cave, like many people have done before, you have the sort of tunnel vision view. And I wanted to see if I could make you know, meaningful comparisons. So I decided to look at caves in the Roaring Creek Valley, the Barton Creek Valley, and the Macal River Valley. And so I'm going to show, show you some of these. Now, I don't only you know, go and do work in caves because of this obvious interest in Maya uh, prehistory. But caves are awesome. You know, they're beautiful. They're like nothing you know, that we are accustomed to seeing uh, up here. But I was teaching in New Hampshire, and I only got off in the summer when it's the rainy season. Yeah. <clears throat> and I remember some of my friends said, you're going to go do cave work in the rainy season? Duh! You know, some of these kids flood, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But anyway, so here we are. Um, you know, and so sometimes you have to brave over. In fact, a couple times you had to sleep over there. Um, I never showed this slide at the University of New Hampshire. <laughs> and if any of you pass the word up to NAU. Um, I am very adept at human sacrifice. <laughs> so I started to do some of this work at the, in the Roaring Creek Valley because I had done some uh, preliminary work there some years before. And um, this other friend of mine, colleague, who is a geomorphologist, how he does cave formation processes. And I used to cave with Tom Miller. He's an American, um, now teaches at the University of Puerto Rico. And um, I used to tag along with him. And he would be going and checking out you know, the erosion and all that kind of stuff, um, the boring stuff. Um, and I would, of course, do the archaeology. Well, I had told Tom about a cave I had worked in the lower Roaring Creek. And so in 1992, yes, um, folks from National Geographic wanted to do this documentary that was made and called uh, Journey to the Underworld. Um, they wanted a cave archaeologist to be part of it, and uh, I don't know why the hell they asked me to do it, but uh, I, I did. And so they wanted me to go into a cave I'd never been to before. And so I get, got in touch with Tom, and I said, Tom, do you have a, because I used to tell him about new caves I found, and I said, do you have a new cave for me? And he said, and he said I can still recall, he goes, do I ever have the cave for you? <laughs> um, and it's this cave called Aktun Tunichil Muknal, which means Cave of the Stone Sepulchre. But the acronym we use for it is ATM. Um, <laughs> so I decided to go there, and awesome cave. In fact, I remember when we were doing the, um, the show with, with uh, National Geographic, the guy said to me, um, well, how is it going in there for the first time? And I said, uh, I have two ways I could answer that question. One for public television and one for adults only. <laughs> the one for public television was, you know how it is for a kid on his, on his or her first time at Toys R Us? <laughs> it's like, you know. Um, I'm not going to give you the adults only right now. <laughs> Check, this guy's recording me. <clears throat> so anyway, um, so here we were at uh, ATM. One of the first things we did at this cave was we did a map of the cave like any good archaeologist. And we found that most of the archaeological deposits were in the lower section. The cave is actually about four miles in length. And, um, but like I said, but the, the bulk of the archaeological stuff there. From here on, the cave becomes a lot more challenging, and we didn't find uh, any remains there. So I'm going to just take you to a couple places, not you know, every spot um, where we found some awesome cultural remains. The first place I'm going to take you is what we call the Stila Chamber. Um, and we call it the Stila Chamber because we found two slate monuments that were held together by a bunch of speleothems. Speleothems, fancy word that I got from the geomorphologist, that can mean either stalactite or stalagmite or cave rock. All right? So held together by, by these uh, speleothems. And, um, and then all around it, you can see there's a part of a big dish, red dish. And we found two obsidian blades down there and a few other objects that I'll share with you. We also mapped this little alcove. It drops off. And here's a little alcove. And right in the middle there is where we have these 
uh, two slate monuments, and then artifacts, 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 artifacts. So here's a close-up of the two slate monuments. Right away, I remember looking at this when I, when I took the photograph. And if you look carefully, look at this one. It's notched on the side. Guess how many notches on each side? Damn, you guys are good cave archaeologists already. You're better than my students at NAU. <clears throat> and then this one here is pointy. Um, pointy like an obsidian blood letter. Now, when I remember looking at this too, I thought, what seems to have notches? Stingray spines. You know what the Maya used to use stingray spines for? Well, for those who don't know, I'll tell you, but do not try it at home. <laughs> they would use the stingray spines or the obsidian blood letters to pierce their thumb, tongue, or penis and l collect this blood and then burn, you know, on bark paper and then burn it. And folks, I'm not making this up. I'll show you some images. Um, we also found uh, next to it, like I said, here are some of the pots. This was a beautiful pot. And this was a crude representation of Tlaloc, or the rain god. It's a sort of Mexican version of Chac, the Maya rain god. So, so, and then right at the base here, we found those two obsidian blood letters. So I thought, is it possible that the Maya would stop here as they made their way deeper into the cave to conduct bloodletting rituals? And as I said, often we see lots of images of Maya rulers, you know, either sitting or standing. Um, you know, piercing whatever part of their body, dripping this blood on the bark paper, and then later burning this paper. And as the smoke went up, you know, the essentially, um, you know, life-giving blood goes up into smoke, the essence of life, so to speak. Um, and so, and, and usually they would use these big bowls. And like I said, we have four of them that we found there. Uh, again, just a close-up of some of the slate monuments. Here, I, can, I was going to, uh, some of the examples. Here you can see this male holding what seems to be a torch inside of a building. And the woman here is running this exaggerated rope with thorns through her tongue. And then she collects, there's the dish, and there's the paper with drops of blood on it. This comes from a site known as Yashchilan. Here, a painting from the cave site of Natunich in Guatemala, and this guy here, you can, he's grimacing, and right, and, you know, he's got, he's doing something between the legs, go figure. <laughs> this is a figurine from Haina. Haina is a small island off the coast of Campeche. Guess what he's doing? Same sort of thing. Here, this guy has probably already bloodlet, and there's the bowl. So we have good, um, you know, evidence of this. I mentioned the little slate crude slate effigy of uh, Tlaloc. Um, we also found this beautiful dish. Um, this is the same dish. I just took photographs as I turned it. And here's a scrolled out drawing. It shows this warrior right here presenting a captive. The captive is kneeling down um, to this lord. The lord has got a, like a war staff and all the fancy headdress. There's a little dwarf in the second panel. Um, there was also a little dog. You can see the dog head. Dwarfs and dogs are usually associated with cave art because dogs, and in fact, even in northern Mesoamerica, I don't know about uh, this area here, but dogs lead you through the underworld. All right, so there's that, that kind of connection. Up in the main chamber, there was all kinds of really awesome um, materials as well as just beautiful cave formation. Um, this is the, the main chamber. Um, and, and again, like I said, just really, really uh, beautiful uh, area, rimstone dams, beautiful uh, limestone formations. Um, again, my brother-in-law and his wife and my wife uh, in, in the cave there. Uh, so I'm just going to share a few of the awesome cave slides. And then everything you see above ground is either pottery or a skull or, or grinding stone. Um, and I'll show you uh, some of those images. And we rarely ever find any complete artifact because the Maya believed that after you, whenever you did some of these rituals, you were supposed to use things that were zuhui, pure, uncontaminated. So you make something new. And then you go and you use it for the ceremony. And at the end, you terminate it. You terminate it either by smashing it, 
knocking a little piece off or cutting a kill hole into it. And you see, you see that throughout the cave. Um, you know, sometimes you would find you know, a, a vessel and it's missing a leg. And in fact, in a couple of cases, I would find part of it way over in another chamber. And I often tell my student, my, I remember one student said, why did I do that? I said, to screw the archaeologist. <laughs> um, but anyway, again, you know, some, uh, some more examples of some of the, you can see a little kill hole right there. This one had a little chip on the other side of the vessel. Um, this one vessel here had a little monkey figure, and I'm not going to go into why monkey figures. But many of the artifacts we were finding in the caves um, were, in fact, wh what did we find out about them? Well, many of them are agricultural or food producing implements. That's from a figurine, the little head of a dog. Um, these, and these stone tools were very likely utilized as hoes to till the soil. And of course, the metate with the mano to grind the corn. And in cases where preservation is good, we find offerings inside the pots like small ears of corn, the, the corn cob, from the first years before the, the corn actually matured. Um, today, the Mayas still do this. They go into caves to take food to feed the dead. On the day of the dead, which is my birthday, uh, appropriately, um, people you know, in, my, in, in some of the traditional communities will take uh, offerings of food to the graves. I remember as a kid, I used to go with some of my buddies and we'd eat some of the food. <laughs> my, my mom never knew this. <clears throat> if she did, I would have been toast, burnt toast. Um, but anyway, so, you know, so a lot of the, the materials we find in caves uh, seem to be associated with agriculture or agricultural fertility. Um, or, you know, one of the ways that I've now interpreted it is that the Maya were going to some of these caves to offer food to the gods because it's an act of reciprocity. If you feed the gods, the gods will in turn feed you. And we start to see this from, you know, from fairly early on. But as we get closer, and in fact, during the time of the decline of Maya civilization, we start to see them upping the ante. They start to offer humans. Now remember, what are humans made from? So you're feeding the gods. So they up the ante, and they now start to sacrifice humans in the caves. And we have lots of evidence for that. There's one skull. You can see there's another skull there, another skull. Um, this, uh, um, lots of children. In fact, children are the preferred victims of sacrifice to the rain god. That was true even in the Aztec area, in Oaxaca, I mean all over Mesoamerica, that children were the preferred victims of sacrifice. And in fact, the, the Spanish priests said that a lot of times they would pull the nails off from the children to force them to cry, all right, because the crying summoned the rain god from, from the caves. Um, again, children, this uh, little guy here was no older than, uh, than 12 months. Same thing here. In fact, this is the little skull right there. You can see the trauma to the skull right there. And you can see the little leg bone right there, another leg bone. This kid here is about seven years old. This one, uh, about nine, you know, plus or minus, of course. Um, and this, uh, this skeleton here is from a young male probably somewhere around 16 to 16, 17 years old. Um, so we find lots of evidence. And what was also interesting is that doing the work in the rainy season paid off because I noticed a pattern. Many of the skeletons that we were finding, we were finding them either in areas where water flowed or where there was drip water from stalactites. Again, why? If humans are made from corn, water will make them resurrect like the corn god. So it's a fertility uh, association. Um, and you can see it. another cave we worked at. Look at the skulls. Right, where, This is where the water flows. There are two, three skulls uh, in this area. Um, we also found some artwork in some of the caves. And I'm not going to dwell too much on this. You know, hand prints are the oldest form of human cave art. They started doing it in the upper Paleolithic. It's like, you know, almost 100,000 or more years ago, and they still do it. The Aborigines in Australia continue to do it as a sort of sign I was here. Or, um, Barton Creek Cave, this is the other um, uh, river valley. Again, we did our map, and then we went in. There's a person there for scale. There's another person right there sitting down. 
So some of these caves, like I said, are massive. Right? It, you can get lost in them. Um, in fact, you can, get, you can easily get turned around. Um, and in good preservation, we, we find pine torches. So they were using pine torches. Uh, I, I had nothing but respect for ancient Maya cavers. Um, I mean, these guys, I go in there with, you know, a uh, good um, hard hat, a uh, Petzl hard hat with, you know, great lamps and lots of batteries, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, these guys were carrying all kinds of stuff as offerings with torches and, um, and bare feet. Um, good preservation, baskets, um, or, or in this case, bags that they were taking organic materials as offerings. Um, and again, skulls. And here you can see an example of one of these early cobs of corn. It's like the first, like I said, the first years where they're taking them in as, as offerings and as thank you. A uh, human um, a little uh, finger bone carved in the form of a, of a person. You can see the nose, the mouth there, the little arm, elbow, fingers. Um, and then we also did some radiocarbon dates. And this is where it started to get really interesting because most of our dates were lining up between 750 and 900 AD. Now, why is that important? Well, who are the people using the caves? Obviously, the folks that live up top. And what is going on up top? Well, 750 to about 900 AD is the terminal classic. It's when all hell is breaking loose, when things are starting to go awfully wrong for the Maya. In fact, so wrong that eventually many of the large cities, like some of the ones I showed you, are being abandoned and people are packing up and going. All right? There is no question about that. We know that Belize, we guesstimate that the population around 500-600 AD was about a million. Today we only have 350,000. Um, but you know, a lot of these places are just completely abandoned um, around this time. And um, you know, we mapped sites all over the place. Uh, and again, dates that we get from this site indicate abandonment between you know, this 750 to, to 900 AD uh, period. Now, that cave that I just showed you is right there. And we have big sites. And these are all sites that we mapped in this river valley. Um, the yellow is the flood zone. So we didn't find anything there. So, you know, these areas were very populated. Today you go in there and it's all jungle and you think, wow, you know, why would they leave such a lush um, environment? Well, when you look at that kind of density, population density, you know that that area was probably very cleared off. Um, and in fact, today we have just started to use LIDAR survey. Do you guys know what LIDAR survey is? It's God's gift to the tropical archaeologist. <laughs> It's like you go and you tell, you know, you, you say, napalm the forest. Burn off all the forest, and then you can see everything down below. Well, Western Belize, we just got this big grant a couple of years ago, and we lidar surveyed um, all around the sites that I just showed you a little while ago. Um, and I'll, give you some, I'll show you some lidar images for Karako, which today is in this really thick uh, Chiquibol Forest Reserve. So uh, we'll come up uh, to, to the LIDAR uh, survey of that area. Um, we also did some work at another cave site up in this river valley here called Chechemha. And just quickly here, the entrance to Chechemha, really small. But once you get in there, just tons of pots. And we found preserved in there corn cobs, anato seeds, and cacao seeds, cacao for making chocolate. Um, and one of the things we decided to do there is look at the use intensity um, to see whether it matched up with what we were seeing at other cave sites. And so, again, lots of pots, you know, kill holes, you know, smash, sometimes just a little piece chipped off. Um, every room in here was just filled with lots of pottery. And again, they're using these caves from very early on, from about 900 BC, but they start to intensively utilize the caves for ritual around this time period of 750 to 900 AD. So something is going wrong, because if you're going into the caves to conduct rituals or to request that the rains come that for agricultural fertility, then when is it that you pray the most? As we say, when you're in deep, you know what, <laughs> right? Um, 
I usually pray a lot when I'm hanging up on those ropes now coming down. <laughs> um, but anyway, so again, you can see that's when they're, you know, the activity in caves intensify. And there's got to be a, a, a reason for this intensification. So here we go, yeah. So one of the things that I've started, you know, I started to argue is that when you look at the occupation, the settlement of some of these sites, today you look there and it's all jungle. You know, these trees are over 100 feet tall. When you take a LIDAR photograph, there's that same building. And this whole landscape was clear cut. These are all agricultural terraces. I have another image. Same structure. And look at all the lines. These are all agricultural terraces all over. And every hilltop, these are all archaeological, these are all you know, mound groups on every hilltop. So again, we know that by you know, 7 to 900 AD, we have you know, highest settlement density. And the Maya were farmers. They relied on corn agriculture. You cannot plant corn under the shade of the tree. Okay, like cacao. It doesn't work. You clear cut. And so we, we have evidence for massive deforestation, um, not only to plant corn, but also to use for wood. I mean, wood for cooking, for making lime, you know, and lime was really important for them for construction, for processing corn, etc. cetera. Um, again, look at this, you know, and we've gone out to ground truth it. And these are all agricultural terraces. There's a, a wall of the terrace. So the evidence for, you know, intensive settlements and deforestation is incredible. And then we got even luckier. Around the same time that I was in New Hampshire, this uh, colleague in the geologist department informed us and said, guess what, there's some breakthroughs. You can now cut stalactites and stalagmites, and they actually have rings, like trees, but they work a little bit different. You know how tree rings, the thickness is based on precipitation, whether it's lots or little uh, precipitation. Well, in the case of stalagmites and, and stalactites, it doesn't work like that, but we know that Certain ratios, certain oxygen isotopes vary between wetter and drier periods, especially oxygen 18. That's also true of these little things called uh, these microorganisms uh, up in the, um, in the ice sheets uh, in, you know, uh, in the far north, foraminiferas, also ab ab absorb um, oxygen isotopes. Well, this other colleague had caught one of these stalactites and you can also date each ring. Like I said, I'm not gonna get in, in too much detail here. And what he found was that, look at this, between about 800 AD, or starting from about 700 AD, right up to about 1200 AD, there were some major drought conditions going on uh, in, in the area around Karakol. So, you know, and, and up there, you know, th there was no rivers to do irrigation, right? So we decided, well, let's, you know, get some, uh, a grant and let's do a whole series of other uh, stalagmites and stalactites. And we did that uh, from southern Belize. And like I said, you know, using uranium thorium or thorium uranium dating systems, you can date each ring, but then you can also measure the amount of oxygen isotopes which re reflect dry and wet. And we have now established like a 100 year record of climatic change um, and even longer. And you can see some examples here, again, from about 700 AD to about 1200. Look, if you were to draw a median right through there, just before 700 AD, they're getting a fair bit of rainfall. Once in a while you have droughts, but not too bad. And then you get to about 700 AD, some serious droughts. It picks up a little bit there, but it continues, and look at that long extended periods of drought. Um, and when you match that with other events, other proxies in a second, this is that same time period. If you look at these lines, it goes like this, the terminal classic period, 700 to about 900 AD, major droughts right there. Here again, this time we compared other um, studies that were done of lake sediments, um, Lake Chikanaknab in the Yucatan, and again, look at these serious drought conditions right around 700 AD. And then in the Cariaco Basin in Venezuela, again, some very uh, major droughts right about there. Now, when we look at archaeological sites, 
Let's, so forget the climate, climatic record. Look what we see. About 1,000 BC, Maya population is going, it's increasing. Lots of new sites are being added. Cities are getting even bigger. And then you hit about 750 AD and the death rate of Maya cities. So again, you know, it, you know and, and here you can see, uh, we plotted this, major cities, and then by 750 to 900 AD, they're abandoning much of this area that we're talking about. So one of the neat things then from our research is that it started off you know, looking at caves to determine why the Maya were using them. And at the time, I had no idea that we would end up investigating questions about the collapse of Maya civilization. But that was certainly a fortuitous sort of end to, to some of this work. Because now, what we think was happening is that starting around 700 AD, we start to see this area being affected by major droughts. Now, how do people respond to times of crisis? Well, let's use an American example. Many of you have certainly read about the Dust Bowl. In fact, it happened not too far from here. Right? And when the Dust Bowl started to get bad, first thing people did was they turned to religion. And, in, and in fact, first science, they turned to science. In fact, they brought in people to shoot rockets up into the clouds, hoping to, you know, that their explosion would make it rain. That did not work. When the science failed, then they turned to religion. And they, you know, they tried everything. In fact, one of the things um, that they even tried was to apply uh, indigenous religion, native religions. One of the things they would do is they would round up uh, rattlesnakes and kill them and hang them off fences because the natives believed that the snakes were like lightning and it would bring the rain. That didn't work. Now, human sacrifice is against the law in the US and was during the Dust Bowl. But eventually, what did many of the people do? They packed up and left. In fact, there, were even, there was a club formed called the Last Man's Club. And those guys vowed they were not going to leave, right? Around Oklahoma and that area there that was uh, seriously affected. And eventually, even the guy who organized the Last Man's Club packed it in and took off. And they moved to Wyoming, to Montana, to California, etc. We have good modern examples. Guess what the Maya did? Same sort of thing, right? They probably turned to trying to, you know, build agricultural or do whatever, and it didn't work. And then they started to pray. And they started to make more offerings. And then they upped the ante. They started to sacrifice humans. But even that was, you know, the last hurrah. And then we start to see abandonment of this area. And some of the cave research, like I said, has helped us to see you know, the struggles that, that were going on at this time. Today, the modern Maya still go to caves. And guess what they pray for? Rain and agricultural fertility. And they still take food. There are nine buckets with food. There's a makeshift altar. The altar is four-sided, just like Earth. And then they bend two bows over. And when the leaves drop as they dry, they represent rain. And underneath, they have nine, like I said, buckets with food, much of it corn. Right? Um, here again, they're going in. And they go in just before the start of the agricultural season. And when the first harvest, they will take some of that food. You know, I don't know if we have good Protestants in, in the Verde Valley, but you know, in England, and in fact in Belize, the Protestants used to have Harvest Day. Well, we call it Thanksgiving here. What do you do on Thanksgiving? You give thanks for the good harvest. Okay, it's a, rich, it's a religious ceremony, really, to a large degree. And so, you know, people all over the world do this kind of thing. Um, but like I said, eventually, you know, they, they moved out. And we have other examples right here in the Southwest. You know, people eventually packed it in and moved out. Thank you. If you have any questions, Ken's going to answer them. <laughs> well, one of the things that we see around the same time is um, 
we see increased populations in Highland Guatemala and also in the Yucatan. Now what's interesting about the Yucatan migration, there are also um, you know, oral uh, myths and stories of people coming into the Yucatan because we're not too far from the coming of the Spaniards. So some of the oral traditions uh, kept going. But the Yucatan was not as badly affected by the droughts because that area has no surface rivers to begin with. All the water there is underground. And guess how you access it? In sinkholes. So evaporation and all that doesn't affect it as much. And um, I remember just recently reading the rate of water loss up in Flagstaff in Lake Mary as a result of evaporation. It's substantial. Um, so many of the sites, almost all the sites in the Yucatan are located around these underground river systems. So yeah, so they move up to the Yucatan and also, they, eventually they start moving back. Right? They start moving back, but the Spanish arrived not too long after. Yes. I noticed one of the images of Caracol had a feature that appeared to be a ball court, at least it was an oval feature. Yes. Is there a history of a ball courts in this area? Oh yeah, we have all kinds of ball courts um, um, in, in western Belize. Uh, one site that I work at, Baking Pot, has three ball courts. Uh, Cajalpech has two, Caracol has at least two. And I'm actually presenting a paper at the Belize Archaeology Symposium in July and it's Yucatecan influence around the same time period. As the sites in the, in the Petén, you know, in the center of the Maya world, start to be abandoned, there are still some hanger-ons, um, you know, like the last man's club. And now the influences start to come from the Yucatan. And I found at Shunantinich, the only site in Belize where I have found round pillars, which are common of the sites in the Yucatan, and also a ball court hoop. It's the only hoop we have in Belize. And I found it at Shenandoah, so I'm going to be talking about some of that. Yeah. Yes? The priests down there, uh, the ones that work first, the morning priests, have you ever noticed whether they have painted their feet or their faces blue? Yes. In fact, well, blue was often used, especially with sacrificial victims. They would paint them blue. I noticed that Oh, certainly. Uh, warriors are usually sometimes painted black. Again, in some Maya art, the, the Bonampak murals are beautiful in that sense. Yeah. So, uh, yes. <laughs> My, I didn't. I don't know if I understood your your question. I want to hear you again. Well, <laughs> how do I'll, we do that? <laughs> I can put my car in neutral another weekend, <laughs> and I can roll down the hill and talk to you about some more stuff there. I don't mind coming down. Yeah. Um, yes. Well, the big project that I went down, that I left my job in New Hampshire, um, was to develop the tourism potential. And this summer, I'll be doing some more work like that. And what has happened, when I went down to Belize in 2000, we were averaging around uh, 200,000 visitors per annum. When I left last August, we were averaging a little over a million visitors per annum. We now get more than three times the amount of visitors as population. <laughs> so three times more people come to visit Belize than live there. Yes? You mentioned the uh, Spanish uh, increasing and uh, disrupting the population. I heard the figure this morning, early this morning on BBC, of 50 million uh, indigenous people loss of population with the European invasion and occupation. From all the Americas? Yes. 
Oh yeah, that that that's uh, that's conceivable. Um, you know, certainly, you know, the the Spanish in the Maya area used to take censuses from some of the communities, and you can see, you know, right at arrival, some of the first census um, would have had like you know thousands of people in a community, and then a uh, census taken like five years later um, was like a couple hundred. Now, a lot of them, as a result, uh, you know, they were dying from some of the diseases. Sometimes, too, they would escape and move elsewhere. So it was a combination of both. Uh, but yeah, without, without doubt, there was some major um, drop in population. Yes? You know, there, like I said, Belize alone, we conservatively estimate at least a million. Um, and Belize is the second smallest country in Central America. If you look at the Paten province and, you know, all of, of the rest of the, the Mexican states and El Salvador, um, we think, you know, anywhere between 10 to 20 million Maya. When the Spanish Pardon? When the Spanish arrived? Uh, or just before, yeah. Yeah. So... Lots of, lots of, of the, yes. I know they were preserving the Maya language, especially in Guatemala. Are they using something similar in the East to pick up the history? Yes, uh, the, um, the question was, you know, is the Maya language being uh, preserved and, and taught? Um, in Belize, we have three different ethnic Maya groups. We have Yucatec, mostly in the northern part of the country, and then we have Mopan and Quechi uh, in the south. Um, in Guatemala, there are about 20, between 22 and 25 <coughs> um, native Maya languages still spoken. Um, in Belize, there are now, uh, in some of the communities, people trying to teach the, the young, because it's often, you know, the young get acculturated and, you know, they don't see the need to do so. Yeah. Well, let's thank Dr. Howard once more. <laughs> Thank you.